Thank you so much for making the time. I would like to know how you got into a study here in technology addiction. Yeah, I think the way most behavioral researchers get into a topic is they look at their own behavior and they assess whether there's something that's missing or something that isn't working. And like for so many people, my interactions with technology were less than perfect. I noticed that I was spending a huge amount of time every day with screens, with various forms of tech, with games, with laptops and smartphones and tablets. And I, I started to notice specific things, like I would fly between New York and LA for work. And I'd always plan to do work and to sleep and to eat and do all sorts of things. And I'd start playing a game before takeoff and I'd still be playing the game on landing. And I wondered, is there something strange about me? Maybe I'm just a particular kind of personality. And I realized that that wasn't true, that there are lots of people playing the same games with the same problems. And it's not just games. It's lots of different experiences we have with social media, email, uh, with messages, with just all sorts of online screen-based platforms. And so I, I started to get interested in that because I, I have the luxury of being able to study what's interesting and important to me. I was able to, to dig pretty deeply and a book came from that. When you say we are really addicted to technology, you have data that really shows that. Yeah, so I, I do. And what was interesting was uh, I, I felt that I was using my screen a lot, but I had no idea how much. So I, I found a guy who had created an app that tracks how long you use your screen and what you're doing with it. And I called him up and I said to him, how long are we spending on our screens? And he said, well, why don't you guess first? <laughs> Try to work out how long. So I said, I think it's probably an hour, which seemed excessive to me. I said, maybe an hour and a half. And he said, almost everyone guesses half the true amount. So he said, why don't you take the device, uh, take the app, put it on your, your smartphone and see how long you're using your, your screen. And uh, I was using my screen for three, three and a half hours a day, which was obviously a lot more than I thought it was. And he told me the average American was using his or her phone for three hours a day. And that's actually true across much of the developed world, including huge parts of Europe and Australia and the UK. And uh, I, I contacted him a year later and I, I said to him, I had a few questions about the program and I said, so is it still three hours? And this was a year ago and he said, no, it's now four. So not only is it three hours, which is a lot, but even within just the space of a year, it increased to four hours. Now, to me, we have so little free time a day that if we're spending four hours of that time on our screens, that suggests if that time is not greatly enriching, that there's a problem there. I think the question is, what are we doing with that time? So there are a couple of different things we do. One is we use our phone as a sort of utility, maps, uh, weather, things like that. We can do that much more easily with a phone or with a tablet than we could ever do before. And so that's, that's great. And that saves us a lot of time. And I think that's probably where the phone is its strongest, you know, educa even educational tools, things like that. Going beyond that, a lot of the time we spend is fun and that's okay. But the fun only is okay to the extent that it doesn't encroach on more important things we should be doing with our time. And one of the important things we should be doing that we don't do as much of is spending time with real human beings, with loved ones, with friends, exercising. We exercise less because we don't have as much time to do that. Uh, pursuing things that make us individuals, that make us human beings, you know, hobbies, pursuits that are important to us. Everyone has something that, that they're passionate about or they, they should. And we have less time to do those things because we spend so much time on our phones. Now, I think we're all, it's, it's the modern world. We're exhausted a lot of the time. We're overworked. We work much too much. So you turn to your phone for a few minutes of comfort and that's okay. It's just about finding the right boundaries. And it's different for everyone. There is no one prescription, but a lot of it is subjective. You can just ask yourself, to what extent do I feel my use of technology is hampering my well-being and getting in the way of other things? Is everybody equally at risk of uh, developing these addictions or are there groups, old people, adults, kids, that yeah. are more vulnerable? So we all have the same apparatus, the same anatomy, our brains are all pretty much the same. The way we respond is basically the same to the same rewards, the same signals, the same triggers. So we are all essentially, if you want to use the term at risk, we're all at risk, we're susceptible. Having said that, a lot of what's going on is structural. You know, if you create a universe where all your friends are on a device and it's expected that you'll respond in 30 seconds, you will be on the device as well. So the way we've created uh, the society the way it is now is especially problematic for teenagers and for adolescents because much of what they do socially happens online. It is expected in big parts of the world that you will be online, on your screen, ready to respond, ready to interact with people as soon as school ends, basically, and until you go to bed.
Now that means that all that free time, that's really the only free time you have during the, the school day is occupied by screen time. And, and that's really just a structural factor. Of the, it's the way we live our lives. Now, if we could change that, teens would be outside more, they'd be playing more, they'd be doing other things that are, that are obviously very, very good for them. But they're at risk because the, the nature of, of uh, the way their worlds have evolved is such that they just cannot get away from screens as easily as older people can because our, our lives don't revolve as much, especially socially, around screens. Are there early sign changes in behavior that could flag a red light in parents saying, may my kid be addicted to technology? Yeah, I think the first thing we've talked about is monitoring time use. So if you find that your child is using the phone or any other screen for hours and hours of the day, you can put trackers on just to measure how long. And you, I wouldn't do that secretively. I wouldn't do that without the child knowing or the teen knowing. I would say, let's see how long you're doing this for. Let's try and guess and see what's happening. I teach high schoolers every summer and some of them use their screens every day for 10 hours. I don't even know how they have time. I mean, I don't understand how they exist and do all the other things they need to do. But that's something that's worth knowing if you're a parent. So the first thing is getting a sense of time use. The benefit of a lot of these trackers is they also tell you what's going on during that time. You know, is a time when you're typing work emails or school emails, is a time when you're texting, or is a time when you're spending maybe four hours in a row on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat. So it's really important to recognize what's going on with that time. But I think the real thing is to have a conversation once you have a sense of what your child is doing, especially if your child is old enough to have that conversation, and to say, how, uh, how much do you feel is okay? Let's try and strike a bit of a balance here. So, uh, you know, why don't we pick two hours of the day, maybe between 7 and 9 p.m. or maybe between 6 and 8 p.m. And during those hours, every day, we will take all of the screens, we'll put them in a drawer, we'll lock the drawer, and we'll leave it in your bedroom, and you will do other things. Either you'll go outside, or you'll talk to us, or we'll interact, or we'll do other things that don't involve screens. Now, some kids are happy to do that, and they enjoy it, and they say it's enriching. To me, that's great, but there are other kids who have withdrawal symptoms. It's almost like a drug. You've taken away a drug, and they say, this is too hard. All I can think about is what my friends are doing while I'm not on the screen. So they, get, they have FOMO, this fear of missing out. And for kids in that position, I think that's then a problem. It can be a small problem that you can address just by discussing it. You know, let's try and work out some ways to deal with this. But it can also be a large problem to the point where kids aren't able to do the work they need to do. They feel uh, just overwhelmed by how much is going on around them because they don't ever have the chance to, to get back to those other things outside of the screen. And at that point, the most serious examples, at least in the, in the United States and, and uh, in parts of Europe as well, lead people to, to go to special treatment centers. Those are very early on. The, the efficacy of those is also questionable. Some of them seem to work better than others. There is no tried and true way of treating these addictions at this stage. Um, and it's only a very small percentage of kids who need something like that. But that would be the step, the series of steps. Usage, what's going on during that time, have a conversation with the child to try and work out if there's an easy way around it. And then if there's nothing, then potentially talk to a doctor about it. We all have seen this situation that we are at a restaurant waiting for the food and uh, we see how parents hand the cell phone to their kids so they are entertained watching YouTube videos. Right. And uh, so, uh, I mean, kids learn by imitation. We all, we all know that. Yes. So what should be the way parents interact with technology, with their devices when kids are around? Yeah, the strongest cue to children of, of what's interesting in the world is what their parents' eyes are focused on. So if you focus your eyes on a screen, your child will think the screen is really interesting. If you focus your eyes on a book, the child will wonder what's in the book. It doesn't matter what you're focusing on, your child assumes it's interesting. That's how children learn. You know, they, they, they look up to their, their parents when they're very young, especially, and they wonder what their parents are interested in and they become interested in the same thing. So children at a very, very young age, this happened to my son when he was four months old. They pay attention to what you're doing. And so I agree with you completely. I think it's very important that parents around their kids put their screens aside just as they would hope their children would do in those moments. So if you're happy for your child to have a screen at any moment, then you're okay having the screen. If there's a moment where you don't want your child to have the screen, you have to abide by exactly the same rule because you're using a phone basically is just like the child using the phone. It encourages the same kind of behavior. So you will advise to parents to uh, put these hours 
take free every day? Yeah, I think it's good for the whole family to do it at the same time. It's really hard for a parent to sit there with a phone while the child is supposed to be tech free. Now, this is difficult. You describe the situation in a restaurant, for example, and I've been with my two very young kids. I have a two year old and a one year old. They're 18 months apart. And uh, being in a restaurant with them, the easiest thing in the world is just to put a video on in front of them. And sometimes you do that because there are other people around. It, it would be best for them, I think, if that were not the case. They recognize that as a crutch and they become reliant on the screen. They don't self-regulate in the same way. You know, if you're out and the child starts to mature and gets better at self-regulating and regulating, you know, the discomfort of having to wait for food and all of that sort of stuff, that comes from having to deal with the difficulty of dealing with that moment. But if you always have a solution in the form of a screen that delivers content, kids don't learn how to regulate, how to become better at what they're doing. So I think it's very important that they have those moments of discomfort so they learn how to get past them. When young people spend time on their phone, they are usually on social media. It can be Instagram, it can be Facebook, usually it's any of those. Yeah. So um, what's the impact that being on, on those platforms is having on uh, how these young people are capable of having real relationships? Yeah, it has a lot of effects. So the first one is that the way we become better social creatures, the way we learn how to act socially is we try different things out. It's a process of trial and error. Little kids will take another kid's toy and then the other kid will bop them on the head and say, don't take my toy, that's mine. And you learn what works and what doesn't. You learn that if you say something nasty, the other child cries and you, that doesn't feel very good. The only way you learn that really is by having rapid feedback as you act. And that happens when you're face to face. When you're behind a screen and there are thousands of people, hundreds of friends, lots of people you don't really know, your actions when you make comments, when you type, when you say things, when you do things are very removed from the consequences. So as a result, you don't really have that same trial and error process. You don't learn as rapidly. So that's the first thing. The second thing, it's, it's actually easy for the process of being online to be damaging for the well-being of kids. One thing that happens is because people curate their lives online, so what ends up happening online is people post the best 5% of their lives and they take the other 95% and they put it aside. And so that means if you're a child and you think this is an accurate reflection of how everyone else lives and you're only seeing the very best, you start to think that your life is much less interesting, more mundane. You don't have quite the richness that other people have to their lives. And that's really damaging because we engage in this constant process of social comparison, trying to work out what our lives are like. Am I happy? Should I be doing things differently? Do I have everything I need? Am I deprived in some way? And if everyone else looks like they're leading this wonderful life, you start to feel bad. So that's a concern. And then again, the same process that leads you not to learn as quickly how to interact socially means that other people themselves will be able to act and not really see the consequences of their actions on you. So bullying is very prevalent online. It's very easy to say horrible things online and not to really know whether you're affecting other people. So a lot of teens report bullying in a way that wasn't true even at, say, 10 or 15 years ago, because it's easy to be bullied and for that not to affect the bullier. They don't notice how they're affecting other people. So there are a lot of potentially negative consequences. Now, having said that, there are some positives as well. Um, you can interact with a lot of people very quickly with low cost. It doesn't take a lot of time. And that can be rich for a lot of people. They develop what feels like a genuine, solid friendship. They go online at the same time every day, speak to the same people. And there is something really comforting about that that's genuine. It might not have the richness of a real face-to-face -face interaction, but it's still a very rich relationship for a lot of people. And anyone who's socially anxious in any way, there is a real benefit to having the buffer that happens online. You know, it doesn't challenge you and push you in the same way to develop all this, the same suite of skills, but it's really nice to be able to say, I'm anxious, I'd like to take a minute to think about how to respond before I instantly respond in the moment. And so I've heard from a lot of parents who have shy children who say this is actually a lifesaver for them because they can go online, they're not anxious as they are when they're face to face with people in the real world. And that saves them, that gives them a connection that they might not otherwise have. How, how can we help these young people forge better relationships with technology? I think a lot of it comes down, at least in the beginning, to communication. So opening up the lines of communication. So parents actually discuss these issues with their kids. I think one of the big problems is technology evolves so fast that we don't understand what kids are doing. They are living a very cutting edge life that just doesn't apply to adults and we don't keep up. 
So, you know, now Facebook is something that a lot of people across different age ranges use. But when Facebook was out for the first few years, adults over the age of 35 had no idea what Facebook was because they hadn't been at school, they hadn't interacted with it. And there was a big generation gap. That's not true for Facebook. It is certainly true for games like Fortnite and World of Warcraft and a lot of the things that occupy young teens. Adults don't understand. And so the first thing is just to ask, what is it that you do? Can you explain it to me? Can you show me? Sometimes I recommend that adults actually try to play these games to get a sense of what's attractive about them. What is it that the child is doing that is so engaging and interesting? And a lot of the time the adults play the game and they're like, this is fantastic. I, I understand exactly. And what that does is it puts you on a playing field, on the same playing field so you can describe and understand the same ideas. You can talk, you can communicate directly. Instead of being the parent and the child, you are just two people who understand that this is a really appealing experience. And what that does is it allows you to then go the next step, which is to say, okay, this is a lot of fun. I would also play this eight hours a day if I didn't have things to do, but I'm an adult and I do. And actually you do as well. So let's talk about the concept of balance. We can't always eat dessert. The same is true about the way we spend our time. We have limited time. So perhaps we could agree for certain hours of the day you play the game and for certain hours of the day we do other things. Can we at least try that? You know, just opening up the lines of communication goes a long way. Not every child will say, absolutely, let's discuss. I'm happy to play two hours a day, but it's a very good first step because it shows a willingness for the, from the adult to communicate and it opens up the lines of communication. So children are then happier to come to their parents to discuss issues they are having with the screens and with tech. As I said earlier though, once you have tried communicating and you understand what the process is, the next thing is really probably to talk to a, a therapist or a counselor or someone who can help. And actually a lot of therapists now who deal with, with adolescents and teens understand these issues because it is, it's such a common problem now that they have to understand them. You know, to deal with that age group, it's not a new thing. Um, I have a number of friends who are therapists who see teenagers and all of them understand these issues. And actually all of them play these games to get a sense of what goes on. Now I want to go into schools and talk about their relationship between teachers, educators, kids and technology. I mean, it was surprising to me that uh, French schools are going to ban mobile yeah. phones starting September this year. What do you think about that? I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. I think it's a really good idea. See, unfortunately, schools, a lot of schools compete with each other. Um, there are government schools, but then there are obviously private schools. And is, especially private schools compete with each other. And one very clear way to signal that you are a good school is to have all the technology available. So you give everyone an iPad, you give everyone a laptop, you do all that sort of uh, very ostentatious giving that shows that you are a high level school. And unfortunately, as, as obvious as that seems, it actually undermines learning, it undermines engagement. And so there are a lot of schools now that have gone completely the opposite end. And, and I think that's the better way to educate. And actually, if you look at the, the tech titans in Silicon Valley, you look at what Steve Jobs did when he was still alive, and you look at what lots of other CEOs, tech titans do with their kids, is they send them to schools that don't allow technology. And there are some schools that ad, they advertise this way we do not give technology to kids until they're 14 or 15. We learn the old fashioned way. We have pens and paper and we discuss and we watch some videos occasionally, but we go outside and we engage with, with real physical objects as we learn. And that's very different from the way a lot of schools teach now. I think the better way to learn by far is to engage with real things. And what screens do in large part is they, they act as a sort of crutch. You are not as engaged you don't remember what is on the screen as well as you remember what you've taken notes on or what you've seen physically. Uh, and there's actually research showing that, that when people take notes on a screen, even if they're taking notes, they don't remember as much. Or when they're typing, they don't remember as much as they do when they're writing. So I think there are very good reasons to remove tech from, from the classroom. You know, one of the concerns I hear from parents is, what if my children don't learn how to use the iPad, for example, or an iPhone? Those devices are so well made, it takes about five minutes and you know how to use them. You know, I don't think we need to have them in schools for years and years for kids to understand them. If you, you can give it to a one-year-old and the one-year-old understands how to basically use the device. So that argument that we need to teach kids how to use cutting edge tech because it's complicated only works if we're teaching them things like programming. I absolutely feel that programming is something that should be taught in schools and in high school in particular maybe even earlier than that, but that is a deeply engaging way to interact with screens. 
the way a lot of schools interact with screens is to deliver content in a very passive way. Where's the middle point of the benefits of technology and also how we put that into balance? Yeah. Well, what technology does that you can't really get without it is it delivers very rapid feedback and it's rapidly evolving. So if you're using a screen and you want to make sure that a child has constant feedback, the screen is much better than, say, paper and pencil, where it takes time, you have to grade. That's pretty laborious. But screens don't do that. They give you instant feedback. You're correct. You're not right. This is too difficult. I'll give you something easier next time. It constantly adjusts in a way that you couldn't have in the analog, non-digital world. For that use, when you're trying to create a system that's much more responsive, I think screens are very important. But they have to be limited. It has to be like half an hour a day or an hour a day. To structure an entire education around screens, I think, is a big mistake because they end up being a crutch. And also, this concern about making education fun, I think it's really important that education is engaging. But when it's fun in the same way as games are fun, I think there's a hollowness to education that's a problem. Kids start to think of education as something that they are effectively being bribed to engage with the same way as you would bribe them with a video game when they're being noisy at brunch, you know, you're, or you're out at lunch at a restaurant, the kids being noisy and you use that as a thing to, to keep them quiet. There should be some intrinsic interest in learning in education that, that can be taught without the use of, of bribes in the form of games and screens that are flashy, that have lots of pictures. So I think um, relying too much on screens is, is dangerous, but when you want to deliver rapid feedback, you want to deliver something that can adjust very nimbly in, in short time, I think it's very important to use screens. What was the igniter of that tipping point? It was the, the smartphone that make it? Are we seeing just the beginning of this problem? I think the, the introduction of the smartphone in the form of particularly of the iPhone, and then the introduction of the iPad, so the tablet that became a huge sensation around the world, those two events, when you talk to psychologists, they will say there was a spike when the iPhone was introduced in, in problems, especially for young people, and then there was another spike when the, when the tablet came about. So I think those were two of the big watershed events that made this something that everyone wanted to discuss. That was 2007 and 2010. Now, we talk about being a digital native. The 2007 is 11 years ago. The kids who were born into the, the iPhone era are only 11 years old. So they aren't even teenagers yet. We don't know what they will be like as teens or as a generation of adolescents or young people in college in the workplace, parents themselves, middle-aged adults and so on. We have no idea how they will look, what they'll be like. So we don't really know what the future will look like for them, whether they'll be in some way different from generations that came before. Um, we straddle the generations in a way that we, we, we understand technology, I think, in a way that older generations don't. And we came about, we came to use these forms of tech quite young, but we weren't born into them. We remember an era before. And I think that's, we're very lucky because we have a sense of what we should be nostalgic about. And if you're born into this era of phones, you don't have that. My kids who are one and two have no idea what, what happened before they were around. My concern is that, uh, because this form of technology is young, we have the iPhone and the iPad, and it feels like we've reached a sort of destination. But there's a lot more to come. We're at the bottom of a very, very steep, long, tall mountain. And I think in the next 20 years, we'll look back at the iPhone and the iPad as curiosities, as ancient sort of relics, because there'll be much more sophisticated technology that we'll be paying attention to. We'll think of Facebook as just the first social media app that we paid attention to. Already kids are starting to scoff at Facebook and now they use Instagram and, and Snapchat in a way they don't use Facebook anymore. So things are evolving. The, the biggest change for me will be the mainstream adoption of uh, virtual and augmented reality technology, which has not quite happened yet. You can certainly buy it, but it's still on the fringe. We have some early adopters now, but there's, there hasn't been the same market penetration as you see for things like smartphones and tablets. Now, once everyone walks around with his or her own goggles in a bag or even in a pocket when they're small enough, and at any moment you can escape this world and go into the perfect digital world or virtual world, that to me is when we, will, we should be really concerned. Because if a smartphone can take you out of the here and now to remove you from where we are, to remove you from, if you're a child, from learning, to remove you from social interactions, imagine how removed we'll be when we're actually inhabiting a different world through goggles. So that for me is the real concern. And I think that's why we should be paying so much attention to this issue now. While it's still a young issue, there are problems. 
but only a small percentage of people have major, major problems. And I think we should grapple with these issues before they become bigger so that there are really good structures in place like France's ban of smartphones in the school, for example, that is an attempt to deal with issues that haven't yet happened, I think. And so by bringing about these kinds of policies, when more addictive, more widespread tech is, is introduced and then adopted, we'll have ways of dealing with it. One of the, of the big question is who is accountable for this? Because now we have experts like you that are warning about this problem, and uh, that is just the type of the iceberg. Then we have the tech companies that put a lot of money in creating these devices. It can be the smartphone, the computer, or the AR, VR goggles, as we were explaining. Then we have the developers that create all these very fancy games for all these different platforms. Yeah. So who, who is the one who has to really take care? Is everybody? Is Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really sort of natural human question to find where we can blame. You know, I, I, and it makes sense. I think in this case, it makes sense because if you know who to blame, you know what, where to intervene. You know, should the government be intervening? Should we blame the government for not being more activist? Are we as consumers to blame because we have self-control? We have free will to an extent. Should we not be exerting our own self-control? I think it's the government to some extent. I don't think it's consumers much. I think we've, we've been put in a very difficult position. It's the developers, it's the designers of the platforms, the iPhones, the, the devices that convey these apps and games and products to us. I think all of them recognize that, you know, for a while they argued, we don't, we don't know this. We don't know what we're doing. And, uh, you know, they sort of turned a blind eye in the way that a lot of tobacco companies did in the, the 50s and 60s. They said, we don't really know the effects and we think it's fine. But we know, we, we have enough evidence now, I think, to, to at least suggest that this is a concern that needs to be investigated more carefully. Uh, we also know that the people behind these companies are aware of these issues and have been for many years. Sean Parker, who was one of the early investors in Facebook, was interviewed at the end of 2017. And they asked him, uh, what, what did you think? You know, everyone's trying to understand, were you just trying to make the best platform that connected people, like Mark Zuckerberg says, or were you trying to do something different? He said, we, we weren't interested in the best platform. We were interested in hooking you. We wanted to make sure that you spent every spare moment you had on our device. And if we could tweak something and it meant you spent five more minutes, that's what we did. We had no idea what we were doing to children. We had no idea what we were doing to adults. We didn't care. As long as we were making lots of money and we were making all the right moves, we were happy. It was very honest of him. But I believe that's what, that's, that's business. That's business in technology and elsewhere. So I think those, those people are obviously accountable because they knew what they were doing and they were reckless about it, I think. What we need now, I'll say, is we need a really definitive study that, that randomly takes children and assign, and I don't know that we'll ever be able to do it, but we need to know if children are randomly assigned to use screens for say zero, an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours a day, and we follow them through their lives, how does that affect them? How does using Facebook an hour rather than three hours a day change how you act as a social creature or as a parent or in the workplace? We don't really know the answer. We haven't been able to run that, that study, but I think it's necessary. It's very tricky logistically, but with that answer, with that long-term evidence, I think we'll be able to make a very definitive claim that assuming it shows some problems, we need to change the way we interact with tech. We're just not quite there yet. I would like you to, uh, to share a final message with the people that will watch this video. It can be an idea that we have already commented, but you think it's important enough sure. or a new thing. Sure. Yeah, I'll say two things. Um, first of all, humans don't have natural self-control. We, it, it, we, we deplete our self-control resources very quickly. So what I would suggest is instead of trying to exert self-control, if you want to use your phone less, don't do that. Just have a structure that means you don't even have to think about it. The things that are near us physically are the things that we have to exert control over. So put your phone aside for an hour a day or during dinner. Just pick some time every day as a first step and don't use your phone. Put it aside. Make sure that you aren't constantly tempted. You'll notice in the beginning, oh, my phone's not here. I, I wish I had it nearby. But it'll become a habit and you'll start to enjoy that time away from your phone. I've done this with lots of people and they almost universally feel that way. The second thing is, I think what we should try to do is spend at least part of the day in situations where you have no idea what year it is based on what your eyes are telling you. So if I look around, I can see at almost any point that there are computer screens, tablets, phones, and that tells me this is not 1950, it's not the year 1500, it's not any other year but right now. And I think a really healthy thing to do to gauge whether you're living your life well 
is to have some time during the day where you have no idea what year it is. You're looking out at a forest or an ocean or at a stream or into the eyes of another person, which is something you could have done any point in history as long as humans have existed. I think doing that for at least part of the day is a really good way to reclaim our humanity, much of the humanity that has been leached out by these devices. So that would be my recommendation. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.